Welcome back. Uh, the more astute of you may have noticed, or should I say maybe the more tenacious, that after so many of these episodes, we're only about halfway there to rescuing Santa. Um, so we have kind of an issue because Christmas is coming, and he would like to get home, and I'd like not to strand him there. Uh, we saw last uh, episode that I was still, well, I had switched tact from let's solve everything in Kotlin to let's just try to solve everything, and the most effective language I have to experiment quickly is uh, Scala. I mean, yes, I could do it in some other language. Um, could probably do this in Ruby or Python without too much hassle. But the goal is to learn something, not just to solve the problems. So, Scala it is. Um, so here's our calendar. <laughs> Today is the 23rd. It looks like I have quite a few of these solved. Turns out we're still on day 12. Um, and day 12 here is the end body problem. And it's not an easy problem, uh, but we can still find a way to solve it. So I got thinking um, after my last session, uh, as much as I do enjoy solving these problems, as much as I do enjoy solving it all together, one thing you guys don't so much appreciate, and I don't like narrating too much, is uh, the addition of boilerplate code. Um, code which exists solely for the purpose of uh, being filled in. Um, so, uh, to show you what I'm talking about, I have gone ahead and downloaded sample data for problems 12, 13, and 14. So that's my source main resources as my sample input data. Um, and I have generated some really lightweight skeleton code um, based on a brief reading of the problems. Um, subsequently, I have also gone in and given some thought uh, to the structure of my project, just from a perspective of I want to learn as much Scala as possible while doing this. So we take a look. Uh, here's what I've been up to recently. Uh, you remember every time I would have one of these int code problems, I would go ahead and copy the computer from an int code problem into another int code problem. Um, and now you see a commit message there to extract the computer. Um, so that extracts the device that works with int codes and inputs longs and outputs longs into a very large map. Um, so the structure of my project, well, I guess you can't so easily see that here, but if I change directory to source main Scala, uh, and I just do an ls, you notice that now we have some files that are not called problem x and that aren't called main. I have created two new files. One's an IO channel. Um, Gave this quite a bit of thought. In fact, let's clear the screen and dump that out up here so it's easier to read. So you see, um, the whole point of this is just it's a simple interface, but Scala doesn't define interfaces, it defines traits. So you would define a class that extends a trait um, instead of implements an interface. And I wanted this to be able to operate uh, to input and output any type of data because an input channel is not limited to longs. If I wanted to create a specialization of a computer that had an I.O. channel which could support uh, ints, which could support doubles, floats, big decimals, currencies, whatever, this would be able to support that. Um, so that was the little objective with creating this I.O. channel. Um, separately, I created computer.scala. Should look pretty familiar. Um, I renamed execute to run. So let's just take a look at computer.scala. 
with all the syntax coloring here. So we've always had a method step and or always had a function step and I created a function called run instead of execute. And this run will perform a step. Now previously that used to call a function called input and you're wondering uh, where did the input go? Because this step is supposed to take some or is supposed to be able to accept an input in the event that an opcode is 3 and we need to uh, read from the input buffer. Um, the input buffer is no longer a parameter of step. Well, how is that achieved? And by the way, run here still does what it always used to do. Um, uh, or rather, it does what execute used to do. It's, it would keep executing until uh, the program halts and we detect a halt by keeping track of what the old program counter value is and determining whether step returns the same value as the program counter. I could probably turn that into a one-liner if I were to say if address is not equal to step that would be smart. Um, but you know this is readable so we'll keep it for now. Um, so uh, in the event of a opcode of 3 now we call channel.input well, okay, where's the channel? The channel is now a member, or I'm sorry, is a parameter to uh, the computer. It's simultaneously a member of the computer, but um, I didn't really see a better way to have uh, a thing subscribe to inputs and outputs. Um, and it's not like during the lifetime of this computer I'm having it switch which devices it's attached to. So you remember problem 11 had us moving a robot around, an emergency logo printing robot, or whatever it was called. Uh, so we didn't have to get sent to space jail. Um, so now um, that robot can just implement I.O. channel, and I.O. channel, or it could extend a trait of I.O. channel, where that trait says that you have to have functions for input and output. Um, in this case, communicating a long input and a long output. So, in the event of an opcode 3, at this point, uh, we would ask the I.O. channel for its next input. Uh, so if you have a robot that's moving around on the surface of the ship, it would read the color of where it's at on the ship. Uh, and that's the robot's responsibility to keep track of the ship and all that. Um, all this intcode computer has to do, like a processor would normally do, is just uh, be able to subscribe to inputs and outputs. Um, and then if there is an output, uh, send the output to the channel. And the channel can take care of whatever it has to do to make sure that gets output correctly. Um, so... Uh, I should show um, all my programs still work. Um, hang on. I confused myself. I want to show that over here. So let's go run the simple build tool, SBT. Here are the options I'm running with. I could perhaps boost uh, the maximum memory. Um, I'm not sure if that would actually improve performance or not. It might actually degrade performance. Because these programs, these problems are not too difficult. Um, so this compiles all my classes. They all still compile. I haven't shown off all the coding changes that I made. I did make some more uh, to separate the computer from... Oh, that's interesting. Didn't I get this last time, too? No. I got some other exception last time. That's special. <laughs> That looks strangely familiar, and yet I'm not sure. So mainline three app, et cetera, et cetera. I have a feeling that um, I've reintroduced a bug. Um, so let's start simple. Let's rerun our tests. Hopefully any of those tests still work. If not, we'll have more to figure out. Ay, ay, ay. Waiting for source changes and projects. Oh, 
You're right. This does look familiar. You know why it looks familiar? Because it's for running the simple build tool in the wrong directory. And that's why no tests were running. Um, so I had intended to show you here's my beautiful project and watch it run. And I can't remember for the life of me how to run these tools. It's not like an IDE where you just push a button and it launches the right code after you set everything up right. Um, so yeah, here's all the uh, the problems running, generating the same output that they used to generate. So I have not broken any of those uh, solutions. Um, so what else have I changed? I just wanted to show that this still works before we get into the nitty gritty of uh, what the code looks like. So our code Let's take a look at source main Scala problem nine, I think was the most interesting. Okay, so here I extracted the computer from this. And problem nine uh, was just simply write an int code computer that takes a program and generates an output. Um, so that uh, does still use uh, the computer, but I created a machine to interface with the disk on which uh, the problem is being read. So this uh, machine does some allocation or does uh, the program dot two buffer dot pad to to extend the disk, uh, the memory space out to 2048 um, memory spaces, and then is able to run the programs with input one and input two. Uh, you see here is def input, the input function. Um, so this extends IO channel, implementing input, input always returning the ID, uh, the ID being the value that was set down here when we constructed set machine. Uh, we also defined a function output that just retains the last output value. Um, now note, when I was first implementing problem nine, they gave a sample input and I didn't entirely get the significance of the sample input and now I do. And given more time and effort, I should actually go back and fix my specification. So here they said first sample program should be a quine. And here I added a comment. It doesn't show up in blue, but if I uh, delete the first character of the comment, this test is incomplete as it only captures the final output. So, um, yeah, here's the problem. And this is a nine instruction to change the base relative to which reads and writes are performed. So this shifts over base from zero to one or increments it by one. And then we've got um, 204, 4 being a output instruction. So I actually added some debugging code into the computer. What this does is this prints the instruction. Um, uh, this prints the instruction with a relative base of minus, oh, with the base of whatever the base happens to be equal to. So. The first instruction incremented the base from 0 to 1. This says print uh, the, in the value at memory of base minus 1. And then this says we're going to increment um, uh, 1001 is add in immediate mode. We're going to add the values at, um, uh, the point is I added some debugging code to help explain what this does. And this is a quine. It just iterates and prints out instruction or memory one, memory two, memory three, etc. Or really this is address zero. So it prints out address zero, address one, address two, and the values that are contained inside them. And therefore this is a quine, provided that the output um, contains all of the values and not just the last value. And this does still need 1,010 memory addresses to perform um, this operation. 
So, um, because this is reading a value, I think, based on 1008 or something relative to that to figure out whether or not we need to jump to the end of the program um, or we should jump back to the beginning. And the end is still a 99. Uh, all the L's here designate that each address in memory contains a long precision integer. Um, so that's what that does. Um, the second sample input here just multiplies two numbers together, dumps out the resulting output. Um, we'll note here that uh, my implementation of this machine takes the output stores it in the value I'm calling signal just to preserve my own sanity because maybe I'll want to use that signal for some other purpose. Um, but perhaps I should just rename this to output. And third is just take this value that's very large, put it in memory somewhere, and halt. Or, I'm sorry, read this value out without even storing it in memory. Just read it out. It's a 16-digit number. And yeah, so that still works, um, but now my computer is separated from the machine, can be tested independently if I so choose to test it. Probably I should write some tests for it, um, but uh, I want to get on to solving all the problems that I can, and we're still on day 12 with like one day to go. Um, so the other thing I separated, um, so here's the 11 spec. You remember last time I was in here, uh, this was the emergency logo printing robot problem where you say, I'm going to have my robot print a color, define what direction it's going to turn, and then it's going to step forward. So it's going to print white. Uh, turn left step black turn left step white turn left step white turn left step at this point it's back where it started so I assert that uh, in my test can my robot observe the value uh, the color value of the space it started upon and then have it print out the rest of its steps and then assert that the map looks the way that it should I changed some of the parameters to robot here so it could start anywhere I want it to. So I have it start at row five, column five. Um, it's gonna have a simple program in memory, which is just 99 halt, which is fine because I'm not using the computer to drive this test. This test is just exercising the robot, not the computer. So this is being forced to step uh, despite the program in the computer just being a halt. I'm going to make the robot step anyway. Um, and what does that look like in terms of the robot spec? Um, uh, the robot has pretty much the same parameters it used to have. It still accepts a buffer, still has a row and column start position. Um, I made these uh, non-defaulting so that Every time you call a robot, you have to say what X and Y it's at. We could still have its default orientation be face upward. Um, still have this ugly mess where we have a map, which is the set of all positions that the robots visited. And then we have the hole, which is uh, a 2D representation of that same map. So... Um, yeah, it's pretty ugly. Uh, here's the step function, which just calls output twice in succession in keeping with the problem specification. Here we have the input function, which says get the color that's out of the map, or if it hasn't been painted yet, assume it's black. Um, and there's still the instructions for how does the robot move. Uh, introduced a new function here. Uh, to run uh, the robot, which simply runs uh, the program and then returns the robot. So this is a fluent builder pattern, although it's mutating this object, so it's got a stronger coupling than just a normal fluent builder would have, but uh, that's okay. Um, 
or it's got a tighter code coupling because this is causing side effects, but oh well. Um, if anything, that means that like the coupling of this, I don't remember. There's a concept of stability with software that says if you take one output and you generate one, if you take one input parameter and you generate one output, you have a stability of uh, one, I think. If you take no parameters and you generate outputs, you are very stable. Um, sorry, I'm thinking of instability as the term. It's a ratio of um, inputs and outputs. So if your program accepts lots of inputs, it's unless it's generating lots and lots of outputs, chances are that your program is the weakest link. It's unstable because if any one of its dependencies change, it will have to change. If it's generating tons of different outputs, then despite the fact that your program will have to change whenever the dependencies change, that might not be such a big deal um, because you're feeding so many different channels um, that, um, that there might still be some positive there are some benefits to having such a really complex program um, of course ideal uh, uh, or not ideal but most stable would be if you don't rely on any input and you just generate output there's nothing that can force your program to change um, at least in terms of you don't have any other consumer, you don't have any other libraries you're consuming that um, might have a need to have a security patch or are choosing to change their protocols or things like that. If you don't depend on anything outside your system, um, then you are the only one responsible for your program changing or your library changing, really. Um, so, uh, we note that the computer, the int code computer here has a, has one input, the IO channel. Um, and I guess it has one output, the same IO channel. Um, so I guess it's got an instability factor of one because it, um, that's one input divided by one output. Uh, this here, uh, robot, um, contains the computer. I mean, yeah, this has lots of parameters, sure. So I guess it could be considered highly unstable because if any of those parameters formats have to change or, um, if, yeah, if these parameter types or something about them changes, um, then I'm going to affect all the consumers downstream when I go adapt this thing, or potentially I am. Um, so I guess this would be unstable, although I'm not expecting um, most of the formats of these to change. The only one I'd expect to heavily change here would be uh, the program buffer. And I don't think that that's changing anytime soon, but... Um, that's my guess is the one of these most likely to change for any given problem would be that buffer. So if suddenly you had to support some new data type inside the program um, that would require adapting this. Um, yeah, the IO channel could change, but we've seen that the IO channel is fairly trivial anyway. Um, but it might have to change, so... Um, wait, oh, source main Scala IO channel. Yeah, so that's what that looks like. Um, we go... Don't necessarily need to mute this, but it is kind of noisy. Alright. So, yeah, that's what an IO channel looks like. I'm really suspecting that will stand the test of time because I've already refactored it more times than I need to. I did learn about traits. Um, I 
trying to remember if generics are called mixins or just called generics or what the deal is there. Uh, I did spend some time looking into, I wanted this IO channel to be able to support all algebraic types. Um, that was ambitious. Uh, there really was no immediate need to go try to support that. I was just curious, like, if I wanted my program to be able to support ints, as well as longs, as well as short ints, as well as chars and other symbols and types and stuff. If I wanted it to support that, uh, I would have to be able to change a couple things in my computer. Um, the IO channel itself is resilient to that because now it has a generic type of A. So it really falls to having a computer that would support uh, this concept. And the problem here with the computer, um, you can see right there some places where I say if condition return one, else return zero. And then we're going to write that one or zero into the memory. Well, we need to define one for the data type that you're dealing with. Uh, and that algebraic type might not be an int. It might not be a long. It might be a fraction. It might be who knows what. But um, I started looking into Scala Z, uh, library add-on to Scala. Um, has this concept of a zero. And um, what's eventually coming down the pipe is a set of two different libraries, Scala types and uh, Dottie. And Dottie is going to be promoted and be uh, Scala 3 when that comes out. Um, and hopefully it will offer a stronger typing system or uh, I am not so familiar with Scala but it's had quite a learning curve. I think there are some rough edges about the language. This is at least one of them that I can't say that uh, I have like a numeric type and trust me that the numeric type has a concept of zero. I've tried several different ways to implement this and I just can't get it implemented. Even for, like if I'm typing in capital L long dot zero, um, my compiler is confused as to what that is. Um, not that I need it for this implementation, but I'm just saying if I were to try to say numeric dot zero or something dot zero where something could be resolved using generics in my type system and um uh let's see and why is that so important to do it that way it's because if i were to try to genericize the computer here and say that it was to take some a which uh derives from some other type like int um, for that to work, I would have to be able to, from A, or from int, or some other way, I guess, to be able to define what a 0 and a 1 are. One way to do that, if you were to do things the Java way, would be to provide in your method signature, here is an instance of an A. And then you could interrogate that instance to ask it, uh, hey, what is 0? Hey, what is 1? Um, your class type, your int, would have to have some sort of convenience methods um, to be able, or singleton methods or something like that, to be able to return here is a 1, here is a 0. Um, and if you're not going to use the built-in int type, then you can extend int, maybe, although I think int is sealed. That might be another point. I'm not sure. But at this point, that's like I'm getting way too down deep in the rabbit hole of where Java is today, where Scala 2 is today, and I'm looking and seeing that developers and the authors of the language alike um, are commenting, just wait for Scala 3, or if you can't wait, use Scala types. Uh, Scala types being a specialization uh, also, Dottie has merged Scala types in. 
Uh, so if I'm feeling particularly ambitious, I would look into, and I have started to look into, and I don't need to finish looking into because this will be ready by next fall, um, how I would integrate Scala types and or Dottie with SBT. Um, and I would love to spend more time looking into that, but at the same time, uh, Christmas is this week, I would like to try to solve these problems. So I have a roadmap as to how I would eventually be able to use Scala types and or Dottie or Scala 3 to solve the problems that I struggle to solve today. Um, so that was the ridiculously long tangent of stuff that I've been up to since the last stream. Um, so you're curious probably what my boilerplate code is um, for the end body problem, day 12. Oh, wait, can I navigate this with just the up and down keys without it jumping? I don't know, it still jumps, but yeah, I still need to look into that. Day 12, the end body problem. The space near Jupiter is not a very safe place. You need to be careful of a big distracting red spot, extreme radiation, and a whole lot of moons swirling around. You decide to start by tracking the four largest moons. And we did look at this problem yesterday, so I'm repeating uh, the description. Um, perhaps you haven't seen uh, the last session, so I'll just reread this. Uh, after a brief scan, you calculate the position of each moon, which is your puzzle input. You just need to simulate their motion so you can avoid the moons. Each moon has a three-dimensional position, x, y, and z, and a three-dimensional velocity. Uh, I'm finding this on the right a bit distracting, and I want to boot this up anyway, and I want to split that pane. <laughs> what is printed on the bottom of beer bottles in Minnesota? Open other end. Nice. All right. Um, so each moon has a 3D position and a 3D velocity. The position of each moon is given in the scan X, Y, and Z. Simulate um, the motion of the moons in time steps. Within each time step, first update the velocity of each moon by applying gravity. You know, I should show you at this point what I've been up to. So. I have created a spec, and um, my tests are failing. Um, so let's take a look at problem 12 spec.scala. So here you got moon 1, moon 2, moon 3, moon 4. This is why I said by writing boilerplate code is I did create a class called moon. It does take that input in that format. Um, and it checks, um, here's the position and velocity of every moon at the initial position. And then we step one and we go assert what are the positions and velocities of all the moons at this time. Now here you would normally prefer to have a unit test to split up your problem into smaller problems. Um, I'm taking the sample input I'm given because I am lazy at this point. Um, I could break this into smaller problems, but I think this is more than adequate. And if I struggle um, simulating single steps, then maybe I will define a simpler system of moons that maybe has one or two moons and verify that it does what we expect. Um, yeah, in the initial position, every moon has a velocity of zero. Um, after the first step, here's the new positions and velocities of all the moons. Each velocity is based on accelerating that moon toward uh, the majority of other moons. So, well, how does that acceleration work? Well, if there's a moon to your left, your moon gravitates left. If there's a moon to your right, uh, your moon gravitates right. So it's really that simple. Um, 
but yeah we defined a moon that has attributes or classes of position and velocity starting from this um, so moons should have energy so a moon's energy is equal to its position times its velocity or the magnitude of its position times the magnitude of its velocity which is kind of a weird definition for energy but we'll run with it did I find the defect uh, yes I found the defect in my chess program it was self-inflicted um, it, it was something I'd coded into the end game code um, I'd link to the video but I'm not prepared to link to it so we'll just say we linked to it um, so I would define my test and my test is failing as seen above and the line at which it's failing is after step zero so we're gonna go in and fix my problem uh, to go implement the stuff uh, and again by boilerplate code you see here I wrote a regex and the regex parses the input and I could write a tester for the regex you know if I don't trust the built-in uh, regex library for some reason or if I don't trust my ability to use it although I did separately verify this on regex 101 and that was good enough for me uh, what stumped me at first is that a number can begin with a uh, negation symbol a minus sign so um, now we handle that and so I've got a position which consists of X Y and Z and find a method sum which is yeah just deal with this being super weird uh, we got DX DY DZ again we got a sum and if we want the energy it's sum of the position times the sum of the velocity even though in the real world that makes zero sense um, everybody knows that the energy of a system is determined by um, what um, so there's the mass times the speed of light squared but that's not the relativistic equation the relativistic equation also has some considerations for if you're going really fast um, your mass starts getting converted into energy um, so um, we're not dealing with that particular equation at the moment nor are we dealing with Kepler's third law of how planets or moons attract each other um, so I'm just observing here that we've got a moon and it reads the input in this regex format and takes groups one two and three from that input and that becomes the new position or the initial position this is declared as var this is a variable this is a value the difference between a value and a variable uh, actually this yeah this is fine to keep this here a value is a constant a variable varies that's the difference um, got a function energy which just multiplies the position and the velocity together and here's the interesting thing is step which takes some moons and steps and um, so I think this is where I've got to fill in the interesting part of my program um, problem here asks at the end of your simulation what is the energy of the system right did I read that right yesterday yeah what is the total energy in the system after simulating the moons in your scan for 1000 steps so that's why I created a function here called step um, and I'm thinking this should just return no this can mutate the moons and could optionally return something um, what even would I want this to return so if I've got a sequence of moons uh, is that sequence of moons um, is that gonna be a member of my problem 12 
I guess if it doesn't have to be, it shouldn't be. It's so like here I define take all the inputs in the file and instantiate moons based on those inputs. Convert every like angle bracket x equals this, y equals that into a moon. And here we define a function, or we implement step and then uh, compute the energy of the system. So this doesn't have to return anything, does it? That's fine. Um, so uh, the problem on the left explains that how do you go about computing the new step? Where is everything located after a step? Uh, well, I did explain this a bit earlier, but to apply gravity, you consider every pair of moons and change their respective velocities. And after all the velocities are changed, then apply the velocities. Um, if two moons are in exactly the same x position or y position or z position, then there is no gravitational shift on that axis. Um, but normally there would be some kind of shift. So, uh, moons dot for each. I think this is the way to do it. I don't remember. At this point, I do need to look up even the most basic syntax of Scala. Um, because I'm a noob. <laughs> I'm not claiming to be some Scala expert, despite having written a fair deal of code. Yeah, so sometimes like I find um, examples of Scala code where they just say, here, I'm just going to declare a function, or I'm going to reference a function in the middle of this, and, you know, that's it. I'm like, okay, great. Um... No, I really needed the value of the moon, so I need to declare um, the value somewhere within my scope. Um, so a cleaner solution, or easier to understand solution, would be for moon in moons, do the following. Um, and we're going to call this for moon 1 in moons. And we're going to have a for moon 2 in moon right? Oh, this is stupid. This is not what I intended. Uh, how I know that is because there's a method called combinations in collection in Scala. So for each pair of moons we need to apply a thing, right? Moons.combinations2 in fact, we've used combinations in a different program. So rather than have to go write logic for determining am I using the same moon twice in a comparison, not that I'd even have to write that, but for my own sanity I'd want to. Yeah, I don't know. I've got to give this some more thought. So I probably would like to have a function on the moon itself. Um, but step is the wrong word here. Accelerate would be more appropriate. So this would just change the velocity of a moon. This would not actually perform um, the getting of the next position, which could be done separately. I could create a thing down here. Um, move <laughs> is equal to, and then I could define in here, and you don't have to indent your code this way. You could format it however you want, but um, position is equal to position of um, mm -mm -mm. 
I feel like I've done something done. Because uh, this is not the most concise way I could have written that. Um, but okay, we've got a move here. Uh, my code doesn't compile. Uh, whoops. Oh, yeah. This isn't like a header file. I do actually need to give um, my parameters names. All right, not found, value dy. <laughs> right you are. Um, yeah, so if I were to define a plus operation on position that accepted a velocity, that would be cleaner than what I am doing this instant. Um, uh, the, there's no need for things to go the way I just coded them. I just don't know about operator overloading or I could define a, um, yeah, no, I could just move this function up for, or move this four line function for move up here. Um, and move, I could just call this like plus or something. Um, and define Let's see. Oh, sorry, I could define this as add, and then add can take a uh, velocity, which would be a velocity. There we go. X plus velocity, Y plus velocity, Z plus velocity. This returns a new position. Um, There we go. So what have I broken this time? Not found, value position. Wait, uh, var position is equal to position. I feel like I've done something terrifically dumb if this doesn't compile. Should I just put move back where it was? Not found, value parser. Where'd my parser go? <sighs> I mean, we got the parser up here. That found value position. Oh. Got one too many braces. So brace yourselves. Uh, missing closed brace uh, assumed here. Step. Yeah, okay. When I had moved around code, I moved around a little too much. Now we're back. Um, so we do have the ability to add a velocity to a position. That's cool. So I want to accelerate the moons. Actually, well, that's not, hmm. I am, no, I'm sorry, I do have a class moon. Um, hmm, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. So, a velocity is, here I'm representing velocity as a constant. That might be doing me a disservice. Because then if I want to change the velocity, um, meh, I don't know. Don't know. Well, no, if I'm going to create an entire class for this. I'm going to make it a case class. If I wanted this to be simply just three members of the moon that are dx, dy, dz, I would declare them that way down here. Um, um, hmm. 
Yeah, I can still add. I'm not going to be adding a velocity in this case, but um, uh, if I wanted to add three parameters, what would I even name them? Because dx is taken already. It would be ddx and ddy, etc. There we go. And this would not be a position, but this would be a velocity, which is just going to be the dx plus the ddx, dy plus ddy, dz plus ddz. All right, so we can still accelerate a velocity. Um, So I did declare this as var velocity, so it can be reassigned. Um, so now for a moon, we're going to iterate through each moon. Um, I guess including itself, because it's not going to have any effect on itself. It doesn't matter. We could do combinations, but we don't need to. Um, and... We want to say for moon in moons. Is that the way I iterate through? Yes. Do this stuff and this stuff here is probably just going to be a one-liner and probably could be inlined. This uh, velocity is equal to this uh, velocity dot add. Um, I want to compare the moons in three dimensions to figure out which is greater in each dimension. Um, so moon dot x minus, oh, hang on, um, <laughs> well, that's unfortunate. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to have to go through the position of each moon because I'm being silly. Signum. And we just do that for each aspect of the position. Um, uh, now we start to see the folly of my data structures. Signum just says take whatever um, the value was here and just give me the, is this greater than or less than or equal to zero? That's a one, zero, or minus one. Um, so, yeah, that would accelerate the moon for each moon. And step is going to be or, well, hang on, we need two things to happen in a step. First is going to be for each moon in moons, um, do the same thing, which is going to be moon.accelerate um, over the set of moons. And next, we're going to say... Um, for moon in moons. Oh, well, okay. There's surely a more succinct way to write all this if you're not being silly, but um, that's okay. Moon dot position is equal to moon dot position dot add moon dot velocity. There you go. That's a step. And now we fail. And I am sad. <laughs> it was so beautiful. So... Hmm. 
Hmm. I am confused. All right. So our analysis is that our velocity um, is off in two dimensions. It is expected to have, um, so we see velocity 3 minus 1 minus 1 did not equal velocity 3 minus 7 minus 4. So our velocity was only correct on a single axis. And the other two axes were wrong. And we're both off by 3. I'm not happy about that, but that's a different matter. Um, so, and I would think that the velocity carries from step to step. Um, so once all gravity has been applied, apply velocity, simply add the velocity of each moon to its own position, etc., etc. So, <laughs> um, so we're going to take a look at the spec. The spec is failing at, um, line 24, which is the assertion of, oh, that's interesting. The first moon's velocity is wrong, but its position was correct. How did that come to be? Um, so in our sample input, yeah, the first moon was the leftmost moon. Because it's leftmost, its velocity should be plus 3. Um, did this moon have any initial velocity? I don't think it did. Did I misread something? Suppose your scan reveals this stuff. Add the velocity to each position. What's the velocity calculation? How can I get a velocity equal to minus 7 after a single step? That doesn't make any sense. Um, OK. No, I think it's just that I typoed um, the data I'm supposed to compare to. So I'm not sure. Did I get plot velocity and position mixed up on the right here? Because my math's correct. My program asserts the right output. It's just here I horribly bungled in the most ridiculous way um, my output. So 3 minus 1, 1 is what's supposed to be the answer here. So this thing here, I'm calling moon3.position, is really supposed to be moon1.velocity. So yeah, if you can't get um, your program correct, just change the specification to match the, what the program's doing. It's brilliant. <laughs> I can't believe, well, I can believe, but I'm disappointed that I got this so wrong. And so this is going to be Moon 2's position and velocity. And I did, the reason I was so astonished by this being wrong is because I had double-checked this, thinking that it probably could be wrong. And I did something to try to keep it sane, and whatever the heck I did well, it could not have been more mistaken. So we're just going to pretend that I did this... I type the boilerplate code correct the first time. Uh, 
I don't know how I got this so wrong. I mean, this is not easy to type up all this stuff and get it all right. Um, it's like here I'd interleave position velocity, position velocity, etc. Here I'm going to do the same. Keep this as a nice nine block loop of code, or nine line block of code. And we're going to do another step with a break in between. And we're going to find that all these numbers don't match up with the sample input, which is straight down here. After two steps, assert this stuff. All right, so um, assert that we get a 5 and a minus 3 and a 1. The velocity should be 3 minus 2, uh, 2. Oh, minus two. Okay. So that's the first row. Next row, one, two, or one minus two, two. Velocity, minus two, five, six. All right, next row. 1, 4, minus 1. And this is what I'd hope to have ready, at least to some extent, before the stream. Um, all right, 0, 3, minus 6. Even at this point, it's probably still worth typing up a good deal of this, because in the event that I get something wrong, I would rather debug it at this level than have to go into... Uh, looking at code and putting breakpoints everywhere. Uh, this is a reusable effort, because if I do fail a test, um, then at least if I've got the test defined, then I benefit from um, not having to manually set breakpoints repeatedly in the future. Um, all right, so does that have minus... Where was that? After two steps... Position, okay, this is at line 33. Okay, moon one position. It's going to be what? 5 minus 3 minus 1. And I said the right thing, I think, but I typed it out wrong. All right, um, 37. We're saying 1 minus 4, 1 was incorrect. Um, hmm. I'm not so sure. Uh, no, that is a minus four on the left, isn't it? Ten streams in my follow list, all chess, except you, and you're the best company. Uh, I wasn't around enough half a decade ago. I did briefly stop in around that time. It was kind of cool at that time. Um... Really don't know what more to say. I do try to be entertaining. Um, so how the fuck is this wrong? Because like here, so the explanation above says why the actual program output is a four, expected value minus four. No, I'm sorry. The saying that the expected value is I have my expecteds and actuals reversed here traditionally in a test um, you would put the expected value on the left and uh, the evaluated value on the right um, here I actually have a good reason to do otherwise but um, yeah now that matches up with the example yeah, <laughs> I have ideas, but uh, like no budget um, and not much in the way of political aspirations. But if I had political aspirations, maybe there's stuff I could do to improve it. Um, but it is Twitch. Um, I have opinions. 
All right, so after another step, we have a minus six and a minus one here. And this should be a zero, minus three and a zero. should be zero zero six and yeah I wish I were around more um, because this is kind of fun to do uh, I do need to get better at having a consistent schedule and I say that and at the same time like I don't know if I were in full control of everything, I would... I'm sorry, if I had a, a stable everything, if I had all the resources in the world, um, yeah, I would have a consistent schedule. And we would make this great, and we would make um, this not just me, but about a community of people. I see that there is such a programming team on Twitch. They call themselves like live coders or something. Live coding online is not actually that exciting because it mostly consists of stuff like exactly what I'm doing here. But I do try to be informative and educational. Um, and I've got to say, like lately, I've been watching um, Live Overflow. Uh, wonderful hacker um, on YouTube. And um, he's quite entertaining, even though I happen to know a lot of the source material already or can readily figure out where he's going with stuff. Um, it's just important to narrate to an audience. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm going on all kinds of crazy tangents here, but um, really my goal here is to say in part that... Um, Part of it's just that uh, even those people who have aspirations to do stuff with coding and live coding, it, it generally doesn't go well. It's very difficult to pull off a coding thing. Even if you're giving a presentation in front of like thousands of people, um, generally it doesn't go... Uh, if you're going to do actual coding during the presentation, it's going to have to be really minimal or you're going to have to have a lot of time in which to present. And online, we have the advantage of being able to use a lot of time. Um, but that doesn't necessarily help either, um, because you spend half the time talking to the audience and the other half um, not getting very far with the code because coding's hard. Um, let's see. <laughs> Four years. Uh, I followed you, you, uh, you knew you were in Twitch for probably 10 months before. You do a lot of the same things in spare time with the less company. Yeah. Yeah, Tebow is uh, top tier coding. Uh, that said, like, I'm also a musician. So, a lot... There's a lot of people who do coding online um, that will just have any music playing in the background. And I have opinions about that, and that's it doesn't benefit me to have opinions, so I don't voice them. But, oh my goodness. Um, so... Some people do the coding thing, and they don't talk very much, and they just have the, co the music going in the background, and that's a nice, comfortable thing. Um, but really, like, if you're not talking and communicating with your audience, um, then, like, they're just there for the music show and for whatever they can glean from your coding. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm being quite rude. I should speak about positive things first. So there are some game devs who will do extraordinary things. Um, let's see. Surprise, Mannered Monkey doesn't... Uh, or MM. Mannered Monkey? I don't know. But whoever MM is, that they don't do more coding. I'm not sure. So, 
Let's see. Did I just finish coding the five steps down here? Z minus two down there? Yeah. A minus, a two minus one and a minus two in the last column? No. I'm sorry, here's my minus one, here's my minus two, here's my plus two. I've gotten through five. Okay, next are six, seven, eight. Oh my goodness. It's gonna take a while. Um, so we've pasted some more stuff at the bottom of this. And I'm just gonna put, dump that right here. Um, let's see, a minus seven, we can do that. Um, so speaking of positive things first, because those are the things people enjoy uh, focusing on. Um, some game devs do really cool stuff. Like, if you're not doing coding, you can actually get a lot achieved. Um, it's much harder to achieve useful things with coding while you're trying to communicate with an audience. Um, but if you're doing game development, you might be able to show off incremental progress the way that is very difficult to do with coding at the moment. It's much easier to demonstrate a game being exercised than it is to um, have to write up um, the same way that you like, if you were to write an essay, you're going to spend a lot of time writing and not get a lot of writing done especially if you're trying to multitask. Um, um, because you have to focus on a lot of details. And a game developer does also have many details to focus on, but um, they have the advantage of being able to quickly exercise their changes. Um, at least some of them do. Uh, two of them in particular who've done fantastic work with this are William C.H.Y.R., uh, who's done his game Manifold Garden. Uh, truly, it's an extraordinary looking game. I struggle to wrap my mind around it. I think Dark Twinge has at some point done a partial playthrough of the game. I don't exactly remember. Uh, but the game was Manifold Garden, um, and we were able to watch as he spent so, so many hours uh, stressing out his game development tools, trying to produce this ridiculously um, detailed game. Um, let's see. So it took him forever um, to produce said game. Um, it surely, I don't know. Um, um, but no, we had the advantage of being able to see after each incremental change was made, he was able to test it out immediately get like more or less instantaneous feedback. Um, it was still a labor of love and it took him a eternity to get the thing developed. Um, but it was so, such an, I don't know. I'm not even sure I learned anything from watching it um, other than just how dedicated some game developers are to their craft. Um, and I don't know, like, I'm not sure what more to say other than uh, support the developer, purchase this game. I, if I have strongly intended to purchase that uh, as soon as it becomes available, I don't know if it's available yet. I've been swamped in coding and work all year. Oh, Mannered Monkey went to college for computer science. He's a tech at a bank now. Um, yeah. Uh, 
how people don't want to dive in and just play to test Lee Chess version 2. Yeah, I'm not sure. All right, let's, so we have after 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, after 8 steps. This is what we just finished coding there was the 113 minus 113. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we've got some more steps here. After nine steps, it should be in this state. Five, three, minus four. And by the way, stockfish coding is kind of like this too. Um, uh, but not as entertaining because there's not the word problems. And because the my presentation of this uh, for stockfish coding has not been particularly great. Um, being able to see the live feedback of the engine evaluating stuff is fantastic, but chess is not an easy thing to explain. Um, these word problems in comparison make for better entertainment, um, but uh, coding still takes a goddamn eternity. <laughs> um, do people enjoy coding? Uh, the answer is a solid no. Um, but no, I should go back and focus on um, positivity. So let me uh, talk about, so I've talked about William Chire, C-H-Y-R. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, unfortunately. Um, so another game dev who has done some fantastic work, um, whose games I have purchased with the greatest excitement, uh, was Chubigans, uh, if I have his name pronounced correctly, C-H-U-B-I-G-A-N-S. Um, you've certainly seen my AI attempt playing his game because I was using another game dev's um, library. Uh, so I was using Serpent AI, by another way, another good developer. He... Uh, his passion for streaming on this is just like through the roof. I don't understand. Um, and in some ways, maybe it's best that way, but um, his, he invented a, an entire library, Serpent AI, which is a collection of game tools that could play other games on any platform using a variety of open source Python based tooling. Um, Serpent AI was a fantastic project. It uh, was the large, um, yeah, and I think I could say this, it rivaled Lee Chess in its ambitions. Uh, so if it's not the most ambitious project ever, it's certainly like way, way, way up there. Um, it's too ambitious for its own good, unfortunately. And um, people's expectations of it were too high for just the complexity of the code that had to be maintained to actually implement it. Um, oh. Okay, cool. So we have an energy after 10 steps. Um, <laughs> so we've calculated, you know, okay, fine. <laughs> um, do I have the concept of energy on a moon? I'm not sure that I do. Yeah, I do. Def energy is equal to this weird thing. Okay. It would have been nice to decouple this energy test thing from everything else, but um, assert moon four dot energy is equal to zero. Uh, we'll put that above the three and the two. And the one, and then we'll plug in the correct numbers, which are 36, 45, 80, and 18. I'm not even sure why I'm doing this. 
Um, but there we go. So those pass. I'm not going to test a thing to add up four numbers. Uh, total energy is 179. Okay. Here's a second example. Do I feel like coding this? No. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. I think I've written one test, and this one test is enough for now. You thought dot dev would be swamped. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how to explain that. Um, oh, so I haven't gotten through all my fantastic developers yet. So I did talk about Chubigans and how he's doing something very exciting. Um, all right, so I just have to write this line of code out a thousand times, and um, that's not the way to do it. Uh, all right, so probably want to create it. Sorry. Um, so Chubigans developed the Cook Serve Delicious series of games, the next of which comes out early next year. Um, uh, so he would show us as he was adding sound effects and animations and wiring everything together with his game meth uh, game maker, whatever library he was using. That was pretty entertaining. Um, so definitely one of the better, um, more entertaining, and also amazingly he got a lot of things done while he was showing off. So like, I don't know how he did that, but that was amazing. Um, uh, whoops, steps, type int. Oh, here, let's put in a default value uh, for Oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. One, two steps for each do stuff. There we go. Uh, what? Excuse me. Oh. For each and apparently I have to actually define a function in here even though I'm just wanting to perform an operation x times um, there's got to be a cleaner solution list.fill <laughs> could work whatever Uh, yeah, that'll work. Let's see. Oh, dear. Yeah, hopefully that all turns out okay. Um, so, yeah, I definitely am looking forward to playing Cook Serve Delicious 3 when that comes out. 2, I'm sorry, so I had spent some time trying to wire together um, um, the Cook Serve Delicious game several ais including one of which was serpent ai based i think or maybe i could be imagining that maybe i adapted some existing ai to work with serpent ai but um my goal was to have an ai that could play such a simple game because my other ai projects hadn't really panned out so much as i'd hoped they would um Okay, I don't remember the format of the input for this problem. So we're just going to hope this works. Probably doesn't. Um, all right. So here's my sample input. Yeah, I want that as a series of lines, uh, not as a make string. Here, here's a list of lines. So, 
problem 12. There we go. Does that work? Maybe. Um, okay. If that works, 9743. Uh, status. Oops, we're going to change up a directory. So I keep diverting from my main point. Um, or I'm eventually going to reach a conclusion by some strange road. Uh, now, can I use TIG here? Uh, stage changes. I forget how to stage more changes there. Uh, somebody will have to explain TIG again to me at some point. Tebow was so gracious as to explain it, and I've just found this convenient enough for my use. Um, Hmm. I don't remember there being a project folder. Maybe there doesn't need to be. Um, maybe that's an error. Uh, oh wait, no, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, So where are we? So we still have all the other files for other problems. Um, so I think coding could work better on Twitch. I think um, well, chess could as well. I think a lot of instructive content could work a bit, quite a bit better on the platform. Um, and I would be quite excited about participating in such a thing um, at a fairly good scale. I was going to say a large scale, but I'm not sure I could handle all that. But I think reaching out to many students at once is something that would be appreciated just by the community as a whole, not just by Twitch. I think it could, I think MIT, um, and their whole open courseware thing could uh, benefit from this too. Uh, because the interactiveness of this platform is beneficial. Um, it's 9743. The ability of people to ask questions while a person's doing their thing here is useful. And I think being able to bring subject matter experts in front of the community as a whole could also be useful. Uh, yes, we are closer to rescuing Santa. All right. Okay, welcome back. Um, yeah, we just solved part one. Uh, I only writ wrote half of the unit tests, half being the first 10 keeping out the second 10 or however many I did um, supply the correct answer there. I'm going to go on and read the second part of this problem and then return to the rant. All right, all this drifting around in space makes you wonder about the nature of the universe. Does history really repeat itself? You're curious whether the moons will ever return to a previous state. Determine the number of steps that must occur before all of the moon's positions and their velocities exactly match a previous point in time. For example, the first example above takes 2,772 steps before they exactly match a previous point in time, returning to the initial state. Of course, the universe might last a very long time before repeating. Here's the second example from above. This set of initial positions takes 468 billion steps before it repeats a previous state. Clearly, you might need to find a more efficient way to simulate the universe. How many steps does it take to reach the first state that exactly meet, matches a previous state? Um, yeah, this is a tough problem. So you wonder about the nature of the universe. 
Um, this um, math problem, this physics problem, was posed to me by one of my coworkers, who was explaining he was having a bit of a challenge um, with this particular issue here, um, this second part of this day. And my immediate thought was um, that for a position to be repeated in this system, um, where the positions and the velocities are all exactly the same as a previous position, I think it's fair to assume that that can only happen um, that you can't repeat a future state until you've repeated the first state. That's my simplifying assumption if it does indeed simplify things. Um, so yeah, 468 billion is a lot of steps, or 4 trillion, or however many that is. That's a lot of steps. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to tackle this right away, but I think if I give this some more thought, I could probably come up with some sort of model that determines um, the periodicity of uh, the system. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, this has been done by historical astronomers, and they are pretty smart. Um, so this, in general, this concept of multiple free bodies circling around each other is called zizigy. Um, so if you've heard about chess, you've probably also heard about zizigy as the uh, end game engine data model thing, uh, data representation for uh, positions with few pieces. Um, and this is known to be a very hard problem. Um, I think known to the, be like NP hard or something. Um, because there's no direct way to compute how the bodies interact with each other other than to iterate it. Granted, that's the more general problem, and here we're not talking about physical bodies moving uh, according to the laws of real physics. Here we're talking about something different, <laughs> um, which is we got this weird set of physics rules that might be able to be bound by some other set of principles, which I don't know yet. Um, so one possibility would be to just go ahead and simulate everything and see how long does it take us to get back to the start. So why do I think that, um, we're, the first position we're going to hit again is the start position? I assume that, like, this particular problem doesn't either... We know it doesn't diverge. If this were to diverge, first of all, that would be super counterintuitive because the planets are all moving toward each other. So for them to all like start going different directions and never come back to a state they've been at before would not make any sense. Um, but I'm also thinking there's a... I was thinking it couldn't converge either because the moons have to accelerate to get into a state and having accelerated, they're going to be sh rapidly shifting and then eventually bounce back to where they started, is my thought. That, um, that the system is not going to lose energy any step of the way. I don't know, like, how much energy is represented in the system. Well, there's no way that, like, it's 2,226 every step of the way with this really silly set of physics rules, I'd find, in fact, in the beginning position, um, none of the moons have any velocity, so there goes the notion of energy being conserved with the formulae they've given. 
but I still think there's a notion of energy um, with their set of physics that could still represent, uh, you could use that to detect an oscillation. I don't know. Let's see. The timeline could include the influence of the Milky Way with the next galaxy. Another fun thing you could, well, I don't know if you could simulate this, um, but if the moons are sufficiently far apart, um, you could simulate more than one step at a time. Um, you just know that uh, if my moons are all at least two space, no, if once you factored out velocity, you know that it's going to take your moons at least two steps to intersect on any given axis, that you could simulate both steps at the same time. Um, let's see, what do you got here? Uh, planet X theory. The timeline could include the influence of the Milky Way with the next galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people have done some really advanced math stuff. Um, so... I think this could make an interesting subject to explore. Um, I don't think I'm quite going to get into this particular day uh, part two just yet. I want to give this some more thought. Um, and that's not just me trying to solicit input from everybody. Um, I do think I actually have to think about this more to figure out a good way to model it. Uh, it's not going to be something that unit testing is going to make any easier. So, uh, let's go back to the calendar and pick out the next day. Um, so I think one thing in general that is going to make coding more instructive, so that was day 12, work in progress. Um, in fact, I called it day 12, uh, work in progress, but we're just going to call that solve this part one. Get push F, push that if I haven't already, and leave it there. Um, and then we're going to go back and turn this into test problem 13. And problem 13 is day 13 code package or care package. I've been thinking too much about code lately. <sighs> we'll get back to my rant in a minute. As you ponder the solitude of space and the ever increasing three hour round trip for messages between you and Earth, bear in mind you're a Jupiter now, um, you notice that the space mail indicator light is blinking. To help keep you sane, the elves has sent you a care package. It's a new game for the ship's arcade cabinet. Unfortunately, the arcade uh, is all the way on the other end of the ship. Uh, surely it won't be hard to build your own. The care package even comes with schematics. This must be a big ship if I'm not going to go like get some exercise and walk to the other end. Um, the arcade, cab arcade cabinet runs IntCode software, like the game the elves sent, which was your puzzle input. Uh, it has a primitive screen capable of drawing square tiles on a grid. The software draws tiles to the screen with output instructions. Every three output uh, specify an X, position from the left, Y, position from the top, uh, and a tile ID which is interpreted as an empty wall block, horizontal paddle, or ball tile. For example, an input a uh, sequence of output values, 1, 2, 3, 6, 5, 4, would draw a horizontal paddle and would draw a ball tile. Um, to start the game, how many block tiles are on the screen when the game exits? To begin, get your puzzle input. Um, all right, so how many block tiles? So we're counting the number of tiles that are twos. So I've already, <laughs> wait, did they, yeah. 
So the, there is a sample output here. Uh, so back to the rant. Um, I think this platform, Twitch, YouTube, whatever, could do better at promoting um, live coding sessions with uh, authors. Uh, I'm not saying code's exciting, and probably a lot of people hate it and deserve to, because coding is about as painful as any other form of art. I do call it an art, because um, there's a lot of ways to do it. But, um, but as with any sort of thing where you have to generate some sort of artifacts, um, be that generating music, be that generating pictures, portraits, sculptures, statues, whatever. All that, um, that's hard work to generate products that, um, I don't know, that are not themselves generative. Um, so, understandably, it's a lot of work to get things done. And um, because your attention's split on all those other things, you probably aren't also focusing, as I do, on trying to make uh, the presentation of the mirror material compelling. Um, it's one of the things I try to focus a bit more on is, and maybe I don't do so well at it, I'm not sure, um, but try to make the presentation this make some sense. And so that's why I created all this boilerplate code in advance of the stream, even though it did require me writing some code that normally I would write during the stream and just banter on forever about, here's me creating a robot, here's me creating an arcade cabinet, here's me creating a Intcode computer, and fussing about all the little details. A lot of streamers just either will have their music playing or they'll be so busy fussing over explaining details that they don't get the work done. Or um, the things that they do aren't necessarily, they do get their work done. They do make small incremental changes and the incremental changes themselves aren't on the scale that the viewer can really understand unless they are familiar with um, the project in the first place. So like when I'm coding Stockfish and making incremental changes to it, that's not really compelling because nobody can tell like, oh, I changed a three to a four over there. Here's what that means now. Uh, you have to be really deeply familiar with the software to begin with. So this sort of thing with the advent of code challenge um, allows people to readily catch up, especially if I can present the problem on the left, the live output in one of the corners, and um, the code that I'm working on somewhere on the screen. Um, yeah. 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 But in general, I don't... I think part of the reason this doesn't work, live coding doesn't work so well, isn't necessarily uh, the entertainer or streamer's fault. It's just that uh, the media itself is not conducive to it. I did spend some time searching for platforms by which I could um, write code, have the code published in some web browser or any kind of interface other than GitHub, where you can see here's the code changes as I'm making them. And here's the test output on some server and you can see it testing live and you could drill down into all of these different portals as could I um, as the changes are being affected. That sort of platform uh, as of until about last week didn't exist. Um, but now there's uh, Kotlin Conf, which took place, announcing the new direction of their um, library and language. And I was curious, um, like, okay, you've created this beautiful language that um, is easy to interpret. 
maybe not the easiest to write in. Uh, it's debatable, and maybe Java might overtake it at some point. So it's perhaps questionable why the language exists, other than to get developers on board and have them make fewer mistakes in the future. Um, but um, one of the things they announced was, uh, I think, they've been working with a environment KTOR for deployment for a while, and they've chosen to extend that platform into something they call Space. And I forget what it stands for, but it's more or less the notion that I'm explaining right now is their next big project of being able to deploy, test, run, everything about code all at the same time. Um, and what's exciting about that as opposed to other existing platforms is that this one might be freely available. Um, and you won't have to pay an arm and a leg to use it and maybe it'll be collaborative and exciting and I don't know. Um, so uh, it doesn't exist yet but hypothetically it sounds exciting and it's a way to get people excited about Kotlin and maybe next year maybe when I'm deciding whether or not I want to do this challenge in um, SBT and Scala maybe I'll take a look at space and decide to do all the challenges in Kotlin instead or both or who knows um, but so that's one thing is being able to do live collaboration continuous integration testing etc um, TLA plus has been improving lately or it's been around a long time it's been quite good people haven't adopted it because it's probably arduous to adopt but um, it's not like where I can type up well no it kind of is here I'm able to stick within a single language I'm not having to switch between languages but TLA plus might make it easier for me to write tests, but I don't know if I could integrate it into my platform for this. I don't know what TLA plus integrations are for various languages, so, but it's out there. It's good. Um, I just don't know much about it. Um, but yeah, here I'm able to stick entirely within the simple build tool, entirely within Scala or Java. If I so desire, desire to interop, I can. Um, but I don't. Um, so that's one aspect is that all the tooling is still kind of evolving for that kind of live collaboration. But two is that the platform itself, like here, you're seeing, I went through tremendous pains to get this set up. I experimented with web browsers, with various development and testing tools. None of them are geared toward exactly this purpose. I had to ch create my own tool chain here, uh, consisting of tmux uh, that I'm using to split my screen. I've got tmux, I've got w3m browser that's showing the browser pane with the problem description on the left, and I've got the simple build tool. Um, and even this is less than ideal, but it does fit within a 720p stream. So uh, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't think most streamers would go to this length. And even this is terrible for me because I don't know Scala and I don't get my IDE auto completion in this ridiculous terminal view. But it presents beautifully. So we're sticking with it, um, even if it's painful. <sighs> so this is asserting that at the end of my program, one, two is equal to three and four or five or six, five is equal to four. And if I were to ask how many of these, um, blocks that have been driven, um, drawn are block tiles, um, then um, the answer would be zero, that we have a three and a four, and neither the three nor the four is a block. So if I were to count up the number of twos, there aren't any twos. But yeah, so here 
Um, I haven't really fully explained this framework, but it's kind of similar to the previous framework. I've called this a robot. <sighs> dare I call it a game? Dare I call it an arcade? What do I want to call this? Because it's not really moving about. An arcade might be okay. I don't like the name I came up with. We're going to call it a game. An arcade is a location where a game is hosted. Uh, yeah, this is just a game. Um, oh, look, I broke it. Better go fix my code. So let's go look at problem 13 and change robot to game. And how often do I have robot? I think at least twice. There we go. So here I defined, again, a really simple run routine. <laughs> I stole this from my other robot program thing. Uh, stripped out the second half of the execution. Still kept the concept of a plane um, in which outputs can be produced. I'm not sure that I need the plane. It might benefit me to keep it around. Um, yeah, Lee Chess is good. Lee Chess is pretty good. Uh, let's see. So if I want to retain variables between executions, I guess I'm going to keep an X and a Y. And again, I'm being stupid and calling them X and Y instead of row and column. Um, every three output instructions specify the X position, the column, the Y position, the row, and the tile ID. <sighs> We're going to call them column and row again so I don't like go completely mad. So we're going to say column is equal to uh, signal to int. Row is equal to signal to int. So I'm filling in the details. I haven't explained the structure of my program, but I think it's making sense even if you've never seen it before. Map at RC uh, is equal to signal. Uh, hopefully that compiles. All right, should draw tiles. Um, so my map of 1, 2, 3, 6, 5, 4 did not equal the expected map of 2, 1, 3, oh. Well, I think that's just a bug in my spec. Um, because I was careless in the way I wrote my spec. Yeah, so this is the x coordinate, the y coordinate. And how am I choosing to specify X and Y here? Um, hmm. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, there's two different ways I could represent this. Um, so, that works, but also I want to do that same assignment into my 2D array because I'm nuts. Because I strongly suspect that I will need that. So we've accepted a map, but do I not also have this parameter of the 2D array? Of the Well, we'll see in a minute if we need it. Um, tabulate this. 
here. So nothing's using this 2D array. Let's comment it out, but leave it right there because I'm sure in a second I will need it. Um, so here we have a game that's hooked up to an int code computer. The uh, game runs the int code computer using the program that's read in from the buffer, writing back out to the memory buffer as required um, by whatever the program tells it to do. So um, I did grab the puzzle input before this. Um, so I did start to segue into that this is not really conducive for so many reasons. And one thing that, the only reason I bring that up is because I think something can be done. And I don't think it's something a streamer can do on their own, but Twitch the platform could improve this. Um, so um, the thing to improve would be to allow squad streams for programmers. Um, that, uh, let's see, so I'm going to read this in as a single string, so we're going to use the form of this that just takes a string and reads it in, and splits it by commas, and see what we get. Wonderful. Um, so, uh, squad stream would be two displays, one streamer, or two displays, two streamers. Um, the notion would be you could potentially have one host driving two screens at the same time. I don't think that Twitch, the platform, is, or the company is necessarily interested in that. Um, a lot of work for them to go through to support something that only a fraction of their users would even consider doing. So I couldn't fault them for not doing that, but I think it could make for excellent educational content. Okay, so I'm here printing out the map. What I really want is the count of something. Um, I want the count of the things in the map that are twos, um, which <laughs> that's going to be painful. Um, so let's initially start with that count nothing. We did get nothing back. Woo! All right. Um, And I don't know the type of this data structure here. Um, but if I'm guessing that this is a key value pair, um, did I guess correctly that this is a key value pair and then I want the value out of the key value pair where the value is equal to a two. So where it would take me several lines in Java code to write that out. And even in Kotlin, that might be a hot mess because I don't know Kotlin that well. I've done enough Scala that I can just write out underscore dot underscore two is equal to two L. And this just counts up the number of twos. Um, so if that's correct, then I'm a genius. But we already knew that. If it's incorrect, I'm still a genius, but uh, here we go, 270, yeah, it's the right answer, beautiful. All right, so that was just reading in the input from the disk. Um, the game didn't run because you didn't put in any quarters. Unfortunately, you didn't bring any quarters. Memory address zero represents the number of quarters that have been inserted. Set it at to two to play for free. The arcade cabinet has a joystick that can move left and right. It reads the position of the joystick with the input instructions. If it's in the neutral position, provide zero, etc. cetera. Uh, the arcade cabinet also has a segment display capable of showing a single number that represents the player's current score. 
when three output instructions specify minus one, zero, the third output instruction is not a tile, the value instead specifies the score to show in the current display. For example, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, five shows 12,345 as the player's current score. Beat the game by breaking all the blocks. What is your score after the last block is broken? No. Um, I'm amused. This doesn't seem like a problem that is solvable without human interaction. I mean, it, there's got to be some way to solve it, but the easiest solution is actually going to be to beat the game. Um, hmm. Interesting. Now, I can detect where the ball's at, and I can keep the paddle aligned with the ball. And I can keep track of the velocity of the ball or something. I don't know. Um... Human interaction might be the easiest way to beat it, but uh, I'm amused. And I don't know the scoring mechanism here. So the scoring might not be constant per block. That is really funny. So this is an example where you could like bust out Serpent AI to go play the game automatically. And it would excel at this kind of task. Um, there's a handful of things it can do well at, and this would be one of them. Um, so, ay ay ay, these problems keep getting more and more esoteric. So I'm assuming that ball tiles, um, if you can keep the paddle aligned with the balls, you're probably doing okay. Um, keeping that aligned might be tricky. Oh, what's this? This is an arcade game. This reminds me of a demo game called Windbrick 95. Um, I'm thinking a successor 98. Some old Windows games that um, really took inspiration from Breakout. Um, let's see. So, yeah, I'm not convinced that this has an easy solution and even worse um, how the program executes might de uh, depend on the human input so I'm guessing this program halted because I didn't specify an input of 2 at address 0 and if I just set address 2 to 0, we're going to get some kind of output. Um, so I did define a thing called an I.O. channel, and I'm not yet multiplexing the I.O. channel, and I could. So here this says, on every triple output, um, the third says, uh, set map CR equal to signal. Well, now we know in our specification if um, the x, y combination is minus one, zero, then the third one is not a tile but is itself a score. Um, so we do have a notion of a score which we can encode into our machine. Before I get into the weeds there, um, I really didn't expect um, and something that would require actually beating a game. Um, so there's the arcade game. 
Here's my test for said game. Get log. So we solved day 13, part one. And I am amused and horrified by the prospect of part two here. Might not actually get to it. Um, so let's push the solution before I completely total things on my end here. Um, so I will try to push a little bit further with this, but I don't expect to get very far. Uh, so here we have a game. And now we're adding a new concept to it. We don't just have a map. Um, well, I'm sorry, I want to get rid of this other abstraction I had in here. Um, so let's push that out. I got rid of the commented out code that wasn't doing anything that represented the 2D map. Because I don't think I need that. Famous last words, but I'm pretty sure I don't. Um... Oh, but if I'm going to declare it up here, it's got to be a val type. Um, because, no, this is a class, not a case class. Um, I guess var here is optional. It just affects visibility of the said thing later on. Uh, score long is equal to zero. Right, and our maximum score that we've gotten so far is uh, zero, which is great. Um, so this sequence here I'm defining, um, new game, etc. Program to buffer, pad to 2200. Um, the worst thing is that this might overflow during execution if I play the game too good. Uh, run. Um, now this returns the computer at the end, and then we want to print out the score. Uh, did I mean pad2 instead of pad2? Yes, I meant pad2. Let's try that again. Got a score of zero. Uh, it's more like it. Um, 270 and not. All right, so this is saying that if I had set memory address zero equal to one, or equal to two, then we'd have two quarters in the machine. Well, we can do that. Um, uh, so, where do I want to stick that? Set it to 2 for free play. Well. Okay, here's how we do this. Um, so, coins long. Wait, hang on. So I want to create a method to, but this is not going to be a method of the game because I want this method to determine how to load the buffer in the first place. Um, and I'm specifying that the buffer here is a parameter that's required to play the game. Um, So the game is played on a machine. <laughs> We're going to create another abstraction here, aren't we? 
So we do have a thing called a program, um, but that's not everything we want. Uh, let's see. And we have some number of coins. All right. So here, this is going to have a method or a function run. And again, what I might be doing might not make very much sense. But um, so here I had to go through contortions to be able to produce a game. Um, so to create a new game, here's some of the things I needed to do. Um, val game is equal to new game. Now for that to work, I have to load the program first. And so I don't need to run this uh, to be able to produce the game. But um, do need to manipulate the input buffer um, based on the number of coins that are inserted. Tell it the 50 cents is real. It works for the Fed. Yep, that might work. It could work. You never know, right? That's why you have to try it. All right, so I'm going to create... I mean, I could create a factory thing. In Kotlin, definitely, I would create a... Um, so you have a class, and then you have not a singleton. You have an object. Uh, I would have that produce the game. Um, oh, I know, I know. Var load is going to take... Oh! Here we go. Here's the abstraction I'm looking for. Uh, def load um, doesn't need to have all this fancy stuff in here. Um, so what defines a machine? A machine doesn't have a program. It could have a disk. Um, right now, I'm not going to make it manage a disk, but it could have a disk. Um, but the interesting aspect of this is that it's going to return a buffer that is consumable uh, by the game. So, after we finished. I don't even know like if I have to load. It says set memory address zero to the number of quarters. Do I have to load the game before? I can't. It's not possible to load that. Because um, memory address zero here is equal to an instruction because that's where execution begins. So I do need to run the machine first. Um, and then load the quarters in. So that's how we do. Um, machine, if it mates with my microwave, breeds a cell phone. Sure. Why not? Okay, so I'm confused. How can memory address zero represent the number of quarters that have been inserted if execution begins at memory address zero? I'm just going to call bullshit on that. Because, like, it doesn't make any sense. You could tell me literally 
just about any other address and I would believe you. But if I put a 2 into address 0, that turns it into a multiply instruction. So we need to load the program first and then set the number of coins and then do something. But I just don't know what to do. I mean, we could crack open the program, take a look at it. Um, here's my sample input. You see, here's a 1. It's telling me, just set that equal to a 2 and things will work. And I am calling bullshit. Um... So, yeah, I don't know what to say. We could try exactly what it's telling us to do, but I don't think that's going to work. Unless we're saying multiplying the values that are in these two registers and putting the output into this other register is somehow going to make that work. Um, and maybe it does. But I'm, I could not be more skeptical about this. Let's try the exactly what it's saying first, and watch as that crashes and burns. Um, but okay, here we load the program, so we convert it to a buffer. Um, and we say buffer at zero is equal to coin, and then we return the buffer. Um, so here we said program dot two buffer. The type of this here is a sequence of long. So let's um, okay. And this here, where I'm saying computer.run, I don't know if this is the right abstraction or not. So I've come up with a machine, something that can load a number of coins, and they program. Um, And maybe just load here doesn't need any parameters. It just returns um, the buffer. All right, so what fails to compile now? Buffer is equal, oh, excuse me. Oh, all right, I have too many parentheses there. Um, So we've got a row and a column and a map. What was even the point of setting this value at? I'm not sure I needed this map. Am I using this map anywhere? This map is unused. That can go. Um, fail buffer is equal to machine of program dot load um, so initially we have a load with a value of 1L uh, so, okay here we say new game machine oh we need new machine Program one coin because that's the default configuration. Uh, um, dot run. All right. And we got a type mismatch. Machine does not take parameters. I'm pretty sure it does. 
I am almost completely certain that a machine does take parameters. Um, what might not take parameters here is that I've missed a load function. Um, there we go. And here, if I have a different game with a different machine that just happens to have two quarters loaded inside it to begin with, um, that might work, but I seriously doubt it. So we still have a score of zero. I still haven't done anything to capture the score that gets returned. And I guess that's the next logical step. Um, so our game has a score. And I can say if uh, C comma R is equal to negative one comma zero, score is equal to signal, else the map there is equal to signal. I think we still never get a score loaded. That's okay. Let's see. <sighs> so I'm not sure there's much more I can do here. We've stuck coins into the machine and it has robbed us of everything. All right, the software reads the position of the joystick with the input 0, minus 1, and 1. It also produces a segment display capable of showing a score. Wait, I know I heard coworkers talking about this game, and maybe it even had some visual output. I'm not sure. Um, Let's see, so when I call run.score, I'm sorry, I separated the load here from everything else. That's probably good. Um, it's a pretty crappy machine. <laughs> uh, I could call it a cabinet. Cabinet would be more specific. So I could put any number of coins in there. Oh, I'm sorry. The number of coins by default is not uh, zero, but one. And how do we know that that's the default? Um, because if you read the code itself, it starts with a one. And this is telling me that if I were to change that value to a two, I could play for free. And that seems not to be the case. So I went through all the trouble of putting coins into the machine and it didn't do squat for me. So that's great. Um, it is kind of nice that I created a thing. I could have created a function to load this. I didn't need a whole new cabinet just for that. What did allow me to do, though, is to separate out um, the sequence that we read from uh, the disk into a memory buffer. So that's not a terrible separation to have. Um, so it's telling me this failed to execute. Uh, well? We could try something. This dot map dot getter else zero 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 left. So this was not particularly useful. Um, we could try setting this input to return random ish values, I guess. Wait. Um, so let's try that. 
All right, let's try negative one. Let's try positive one. Yeah, I didn't think that any of that would benefit us in any way. Um, all right. Well, um, I could do something more advanced here. So print line of map, right? Um, well, actually, we've got a function down here that's of some use. Um, so yeah, let's print out map dot count of not two L's, even though two L's might be of some interest, but. Um, Let's print out how many 1Ls there are in the map. How many balls are there? 75 balls. OK. I'll take your word for it. Oh, 75 walls. Never mind. That's not a, a wall and a ball are not the same thing. How about a 4L? How many 4Ls are there? There's one. OK. Um, can we print out information about that 4L? Uh, oh, it apparently does move about. All right, that's cool. Um, so, that's pretty spiffy. Um, can we print out the horizontal paddle information? Well, actually, wait, wait, one second. One second. Let me first see if this is bullshit. Or if my machine actually did something when I stuck a second quarter into it. Okay, so yeah, setting that equal to 2 actually had some effect. Probably actually did exactly what we wanted it to do. I was just being super skeptical the whole time for fun. Um, all right, so my program executes, gets that far, and then suddenly terminates. My paddle's at 18, it's 18, ay yeah, ay yeah. um, here, let's... Just try returning a constant minus 1, see where we end up. 15, 18. If we go all the way to the right, we get 21, 18. How wide is our paddle? I'm not sure that it matters. Um, but okay. Input is going to be simply the difference in x coordinates. So, um, let's see. Val x1 is going to be equal to map.filter. 2 equal to 3 left, the first element, x2 is going to be that equal to 4 left, first element, um, we're going to print out x1 and x2, and note that those, we got a type mismatch, because um, this is a key, Apparently, let's try that. No. One is not a member of mutable map int int long. So, 
so... Okay. Um, let's try this a different way. Um, map collect case of something. I think um, key oh I'm sorry and then if key value does this work if value is equal to three left key can we print that out Can I get some sort of printout if I do that? Probably not. All right. Um, because I need something more like that. All right, so we got a printout. Not what I expected at all. 18 arrow 18, 19 arrow 18. What? Okay, what if I say print out value? Do I get something sane? Array buffer of three. Not what I had in mind. Um. I'm confused. 18 to 18, 19, 18. I thought that the key was a two-dimensional value, but not an arrow type. Um, yeah, let's just print out the four L values, the ball. So, X, Y value? No. I mean, I could say row column value, but what good is that? Um, not found value key. Let's print out the column. Um, so his talked about this consistently in terms of X and Y. Let's print out the X. Array buffer 16. Fuck. <laughs> uh, why? How did I get this so wrong? Array buffer 16. I don't suppose that printing Y is going to be any more informative. Array buffer 15. Well, apparently that's the position of the ball. Um, oh wait, no, array buffer is the collection type. The value contained inside the collection type is a 15. Um, so I just wanted to select a value out of here. So if I'm trying to select a value out of a map, um, select by value. How do you filter a Scala map by its value? Retain. I want to be careful about mutating the map. Retain is not what I want to do. I just want to select by value out of the map. I 
I think I should just go to the Scala documentation. It's got quite a bit of information. Look up operations, apply, get, get or else, contains, and is defined at. Keys, get its iterator, map values. A map view resulting from applying function f to each value. But no, what I'm wanting to do is filter the keys based on the values which for a map is kind of ridiculous and normally you would not want to do that but I want to map I want to filter based on a key value pair um, okay the Scala tutorials not particularly good but there's an API Maybe the API can provide me the super secret operation if the website's up. Um, that'd be nice. Removals, sub collections. There's a sub collections thing for values. Um, map view resulting from applying F to each value. Is there a way I can iterate through all key value pairs and choose to only select um, without mutating the map? Wait, I thought this... I clicked on a thing that said API and it took me to a page that wasn't an API. I feel betrayed. So, I mean, yes, this is the value. Arguably... I just want the sum or average, I can just do this. Apparently AVG is undefined, but we should expect that there's only going to be one of these, so sum should be okay. Um, I thought that every collection had a method or function average. All right, Scala standard library sequence. We got traversable, traversable. Um, curiously, sum is defined. Other combinators like a median or an average, I'm not seeing. Oh, take. Take would take the first element. Sum's probably good enough, but... Um, Alright, so... <laughs> that's not what we wanted. Did I typo this? Take zero. Okay. I'm confused why take did not provide the same result here as sum. Regardless, um, val x1 is equal to this stuff. Val x2 is going to be equal to some other stuff. And we just care about the sign of the ball minus x1. And so that should keep everything lined up. And there's our score. We did not write any tests. Um, I'm not sure if I could figure out how to test it. <laughs> Seen 11 on there. Uh, I was like, wait, arcade stuff? To the side. Yeah. Is there an 11 on here? Oh, you're right. My sample output above where I'm chaining together everything into one grand output. Um, um, I want to make sure all my tests still work. Wait. Are you kidding me? Um... All right, so let's switch consoles again. 
verify that my tests other than test 14 pass. Oh, test 14 must be passing too. That's weird. Um, but most importantly, uh, my 13 tests still pass with all my new code I introduced into the 13 class. Um, so we can just get rid of the part one part there. Um, and apparently this stuff, which just tries to keep the ball and the paddle aligned, apparently is good enough. Wait. Um, so here I define x comma y. I don't really care about the name of that variable. It could be anything. I do care about whether this is a 3 left and a 4 left. Uh, right. So... This is a more concise way of writing the same thing. Oh my god, is that so much more concise? <laughs> I feel so dumb. Um, I'm learning Scala, guys. We're getting there. Alright, so... Do I want to give these names? Probably. Um, ball. Paddle. Return ball minus paddle. That works. Well, that was less dramatic than I expected. Um, git commit amend solve day 13. Here's my answer for my sample input. One, two, five, three, five. I have the joy of typing that in. Yes! I didn't expect that to happen. All right, we'll take that. We'll take the small victories where you can have them. And we'll just go on to problem 14. Um, so let's get our 14 spec of brewing. Nice. Um, yeah, this is going way better than last time. Day 14, space stoichiometry. As you approach the rings of Saturn, your ship's low fuel indicator turns on. There isn't any fuel here, but the rings have plenty of raw material. Perhaps your ship's interstellar refinery union brand name factory or nanofactory can turn these raw materials into fuel. You ask the nanofactory to produce a list of the reactions it can perform that are relevant to this process. Every reaction uh, returns some quantities of specific input chemicals into some quantity of an output chemical. Almost every chemical is produced by exactly one reaction. The only exception, or, is the raw material input to the entire process and is not produced by a reaction. You just need to know how much ore you'll need to collect before you can produce one unit of fuel. Each reaction, um, yeah, you mix inputs, you produce outputs. Um, it's okay to have leftover chemicals when you're done. So this is stoichiometry 101. If you've played the Time Warp of Dr. Brain, this should be familiar. If you've played a variety of other games, I think even Nancy Drew has stoichiometry at some point, where you're mixing chemicals and the objective is to end up with a particular chemical when you're done. Um, the first two reactions only use ore as inputs. They indicate that you can produce as much of, e of chemical A as you want in increments of 10 units, uh, and as much of chemical B as you want in increments uh, costing one ore a piece. To produce a fuel, a total of 31 ores required. One ore to produce 
one B, uh, then thirty more or to produce uh, the twenty eight A required in the reactions to convert the B into C, C into D, D into E, and finally E into fuel. Or suppose you have the following list of reactions. Uh, this list lists are cost a hard 65 ore to produce one fuel. Here are some larger examples. And uh, given the list of reactions in your puzzle input, what's the minimum amount of ore required to produce exactly one fuel? It could just say at least one fuel. They say it's okay to have leftover chemicals when you're done, and I assume fuel is a chemical. Um, could be wrong about that. We'll find out. So I thought that... Um, did I... Oh, I'm sorry. I did grab the puzzle input. Um, so yeah, no, this is the head of my particular input. I've got more input in my uh, test file there. <sighs> so let's go back to uh, test Scala uh, problem 14 spec. Here's the explanation again. I prepared this for the stream, so it doesn't look too awful. Um, I am curious, like, okay. Um, mm, I don't even know what data structures I'm going to use for this one. I've never written a program to solve this because problems of this nature, at least those that I've seen, um, have not required a program to be written to solve them. Um, it's kind of an amusing problem to think about, but writing a program seems painful. Um, so yeah, that's space stoichiometry as opposed to just normal stoichiometry, because this one's in space. All right, so I need to have some data structure for something. Problem 14. This is what I got so far, and this is just ripped off from problem one. Um, so, wait, can I, I can do bottom-up design at the same time. I don't like doing this, but I'm not having a great imagination at the moment. So let's start bottom up. All right, what's our regex going to be to parse this particular input? So this is going to be um, some digit, some uh, word, ASCII characters, A to Z, and then an arrow, and then some other digit and then some other word and there's our regex all right well that was exciting i still don't know what data structure i should use <laughs> um So there's going to be two concepts here. One is going to be, it might be easier to think of this in terms of money than in terms of chemicals. Uh, although we could do chemicals, but um, case class currency, where this is going to have some sort of name. I guess we'll call it a name. 
and that's all there is to a currency. And then there is going to be some sort of money. Um, an integer so all these are fixed types even though we know that um, and what this reminds me is of a problem where you have one dollar and your objective is to find out the number of ways that you can make change for that dollar. Um, so uh, if you have a dollar you could change it in for 10 dimes, for 4 quarters, 20 nickels, and so forth. Um, so here if you had one fuel you could convert that fuel into 1E7A. You can convert that 1E itself into 7A1D and so forth. So that's one way you could pursue this is to branch out and try to find um, what are all the ways you can make change for fuel. That's one possibility. I'm struggling to think of others at the moment. Um, uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. This is what I was going for, a currency and a coin. And a coin has a currency. Um, as well as an amount. And so these all have exchange rates and so on and so forth. I think this might be easier to make sense of than say chemical name, chemical amount, chemical this, chemical that, even though it's the same concept. Um, so there's a such thing as an exchange. Um, Or you'll say that I can take um, <laughs> amount, I don't know, currency A, why am I doing this as a data structure? This is clearly supposed to be a map. I don't need to create something that uh, itself produces a map. Um, uh, so here we're just going to put a zero. So our test starts failing. Um, so you have a set of rules um, for converting. I guess that's why I was tempted to create this data structure. Um, I, there's got to be a better way. So what else can I try here? So we've got a currency, we've got a coin. I need a way to be able to read in those rules and convert them with this parser. 
into something readable. Um, and it's not like we have a whole... Well, okay. There is some value to being able to create your own map. Um, so I want to create a map based on key value pairs here. Uh, so val map is equal to something. And again, I'm creating things that are not even testable. I should start with the tests. I never have this discipline. And maybe at some point I'll learn it. Um, so let's start with the tests. Um, we're not going to have a method fuel here. Are there other data structures I require? I do require a map. And I don't want to make this a member of Prop 14, but how else do I do this? Um, you just need to start coding somewhere and we'll fix it. We'll fix the many holes that I create as we can. And we want this to return a map of something. A map whose key is of type um, coin. Oh no, wait. Do I have this right? Yeah, we want something that maps from coin to coin. All right. Type mismatch. Um, all right. Well, here's one way we can get the types to match, is actually return a thing. Um, yeah, now this is observing that we've broken our tests, and in a way that we should be able to fix. Uh, read inputs should read inputs. I don't know. feels so hacky. Like this is just testing the ability to do the input from a file. This is not particularly great. Um, assert problem 14 dot read uh, 10 or 10 a that size we want to put the constant on the left. Um, type mismatch. Oh, it requires a sequence of string. My mistake. Okay, let's put a sequence here. One should not equal zero. Oh right, so our pro our program fails here because I created a map and didn't put anything in it. That would do it. Um, all right, so how do we fix that? Inputs dot map. No. Oh my goodness. This is not going to be easy. So 
We want to map each input to a thing. Um, let's just map this to coin. Um, is it single arrow or double arrow? I can never remember. I think it's double to actually do a function. Um, new coin. A one um, new coin B one and then to map. Okay, and this fails like thirty five different ways. Def run. Okay, so I forgot to do something here. All right, what else am I missing? String A. Oh, uh, so this needs a currency type. So currency is a fancy wrapper for string. Um, it's a safe data type, but string is a sealed type. Maybe I don't need a fancy currency type. Uh, we'll operate on the bare metal here. And try not to get burned too bad. All right, so now we take our set of inputs and from that have generated a map. Um, so we've written enough code that our test passes at least until I add another thing into it, which I'm going to do this instant. Um, one or one B. And um, we still have a size of one. Oops, I typed the wrong thing on my computer. All right, so we're gonna put define a fixture here. Um, val. Uh, actually, we don't need the fixture. We can just continue inlining stuff like we're doing here. Um, so two should not equal one. Good observation. So, to get this working, um, now we need a more sophisticated map. Something that's going to turn an input into a set of two coins. So, <laughs> this is going to suck. Um, because I forget how to do stuff with regexes. Um, so where have I done something with a regex before? Uh, problem 12. Okay. Is there anything from problem 12 I can still plunder here? So as to avoid having to relearn it. Find prefix match of. Yeah, I think that's the one. Uh, I guess the other takeaway is that um, this particular translation into an int might not have to be done like that. Um, Oh, hang on. Uh, case class exchange val input string. I'm a genius. Not really, but let's pretend for just a second. Um, right, so we can just load the parser with this. I don't know if the parser is going to be a member of the exchange. Um, 
No, I didn't define it this way here, so let's just stick with precedent. Um, but... Veil coin one is equal to, um, sorry, so we got a match, um, so this is going to be equal to m dot, or I'm sorry, this is equal to coin of m dot group one, right, and then m dot group two to int and just increment this over here so now we've got some coins um, so we're just going to map each input to an exchange um, and an exchange consists of two coins and I'm trying to figure out how do I extract the two coins from that super efficiently. That'd be nice. Um, um, yeah, so like a destructure here that would not require me to, I don't know, def f is equal to just return coin one, coin two. Um, Wait, why am I doing this as two different variables? There we go. This, comma that. There we go. So now we got coins. And then we want to convert that map. Uh, we want to convert that list of exchanges into a map. All right, so a match. Yeah, we do need to define what a match is. So a match is a Scala util matching regex match. Uh, whoops. Let's switch this around until we got our problem back where it's supposed to be. Um, that was exciting. Should read. Number format exception. Perfect. All right, so we got a number format exception because I did my stuff backwards just to keep all of us on our toes. So let's try it that way. Better. Much, much better. Ridiculously better. How? I thought this was going to be super challenging. Um, so because I've defined a thing as a coin and I defined an exchange, um, <laughs> I've simplified my task. And since I'm using a standard data structure here, I'm just using a map of coin to coin, I don't have to assemble this map from the input format anymore. Um, I don't need a function called read. I can consume that when I'm parsing a file. Um, like I can say that this is um, equal to a given type, but um, yeah, I don't actually need a function called read in order for my tests to pass. Nor did I need it in the first place. Um, so, I mean, yes, I can define this thing called val results or whatever I want to call it. Um, but if all I want is a map from one coin type to another coin type, I don't need um, reading that from a file to populate the map. I can just go make this map myself. So conversions is equal to map 
of whatever I want to stick in the map. Um, so I can say or 10 uh, single arrow. Single arrow for the map definition. Uh, coin A10. And we assert that this map.size is equal to 1. All right, what did I break? Not found, value coin, right. Because that's a problem 14 construct. I do still need to reference problem 14 to produce the coins. Um, OK, what's wrong this time? Oh, the data type itself? Is this something that's somehow problematic? No. All right. Yeah, again, I'm not sure, like, with packages and other stuff, what's the best way to structure this. But this is a way to structure it. Um, I don't like the fact that it's got problem 14 smeared all over it. But... Hi. Um... But the goal is to test one section of stuff at a time. I mean, I could be a slightly more ambitious here, couldn't I? Yeah, let's do a reading like we do elsewhere. Um... Only because this is actually going to save me time. And because I trust that this code's going to work. Um, wait, inputs. Here I want sequence of string. So string one is going to be. Um, 10 or to 10 a uh, and all right this broke uh, let's try that again there we go 10 or to 10 a uh, 1 or to 1 B okay how'd I break this again? I needed to put a quote mark there. One did not equal two. Just kidding. There we go. All right, so then we got 7a, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure if it's best practice or not. Um, oh, hang on. <laughs> I seem to have missed a really critical step in this. Um, well, that sucks. All right. Um, we all see the problem. We have another part of this grammar that I completely neglected because I'm a dummy. Um, 7a comma 1b arrow 1c. All right. Well, it's good we caught that early on. Um, so we're going to have a couple parsers here after all. And this is not just going to be a map from a coin, but it's going to be a map from a set of coins to a set of coins. Because that's how reactions work. Because if I had actually read the problem, I would see that Well, surely some of these must produce more than one thing on the right, yeah? Okay, that's interesting. 
Like, all of these produce exactly one thing, one type of thing on the right. That's not what I expected. I expected if you could have multiple things on the left side of the arrow, surely you could have multiple things on the right side. But, apparently not. All right. Well... That sucks. Um, on the bright side, we know it goes on the right. I'm not sure what to do now. So my data structure is no longer going to be a map of coin and coin. I could... Hmm. I'm debating which way I want the map to point at this uh, point. Like, I could say um, that for this collection of coin, here's what we produce. Maybe that's still the way to go about it. Maybe I want to build two maps. One that says, um, given this, I can produce that. And given that, I can... Well, this is a one-way function, isn't it? I still think that having a key... I don't know. I guess we'll keep the structure of the input. Um... So we're going to produce another parser, a really simple parser here. There we go. Uh, and then we're going to have something that splits it at the arrow. Um, So, I think for my sanity, we're going to say we're going to split an arrow right in the center. Which is going to break everything. Uh, I've also defined parser twice, which we don't need. Um, We're also going to now define coin as accepting a string input. And I'm really not sure what to... Well... So, given that we're going to have a matcher, and it's going to do some kind of something on it. In fact... Ew. Well, that's kind of ugly. Um, so find prefix match of input, etc. All right, and then we got an exchange. Which no longer requires the matcher. Um, actually, maybe we don't split this, uh, we save the split for the exchange to perform. And val coins is going to be equal to, um, Input dot split uh, on 
arrow uh, zero. Mapping to point of input dot split again on arrow. Uh, oh, I see what I did wrong here. Take at the address one. And this goes kaboom because coin is already defined as case class coin. Right, so I defined this twice just to keep things exciting. Um, wait, did I seriously just do that? I did. <laughs> uh, okay. Ay, ay, ay. So, I need more words. I guess we're going to introduce a new word there, coins, with the S on it. Um, this is going to be a map of coins to coin. <sighs> All right, not enough arguments for method apply currency amount. Um, what have I missed? Oh, here, yeah. yeah okay, let's just not make any assumptions at this point. Um, all right, so. This is probably observing that what I've done with my program no longer matches the data types that are being enforced. Uh, type mismatch. Yeah, I thought so. So we've changed some of the underlying assumptions of our program. This is no longer a map of a single coin to a single coin, but multiple to multiple. Um, that said, um, the conversions aren't what we think they are. So if I can just like type, um, we can see here's our map 10 or to 10A, 1 or to 1B, 7A, 1B to 1C. Um, that worked. I didn't think that would work because I wasn't thinking. Um, no, that actually works. I'll be damned if I could figure out how, though. Like, 7A1B, how did that ever get resolved? Because my matcher only matches the prefix. It doesn't attempt to find all matches. It just attempts to find one match. So the fact that like 7a and 1b were found by this prefix matcher doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I, I am at a complete loss here. There's no way. Like if I were to change my, I don't know how I could prove that this is defective, but it makes no sense to me that this works. 
it's good that we have a parser. It's good that we have a way of being able to parse the string. But, um, as for how it retained all of that context, I don't understand. Because here I have coins accepting an input. I'm attempting to find the prefix match M on that input. I think what I'm printing out is the input string and is not itself the set of coins contained within coins. I think this value here, input, is what's getting printed out. And that's what's deluding me into thinking this could have worked when clearly it could not have. Um, So what can I do now? I mean, I could further split this here. Um, and then for each value in the sequence, uh, I could produce a coin. Um, also, I'm starting to realize that input is just becoming less and less useful of a term. Um, I need a better term. Well, also, like, this doesn't even belong here. So... <sighs> yeah, so I should go back to my original thought here, which was that, um, the currency is... Equal to um, M dot group two and val amount is equal to M dot group one dot two int. Um, I think this will work better. Um, so what now? Get rid of coins as a structure. Um, and yeah, now here I need to do something tricky. So input split this, split the input again. Then after I'm done splitting, we want to produce coins from each string. Um, okay, not found type coins. Understandable. So our map is going to be from a sequence of coin to a coin. We can deal with string as little as we can. And not found type coins. Where is coins still in use? 
over here. Okay, uh, what's wrong now? Um, found a collection, uh, a mutable collection of a ray of coin where we require a sequence of coin to coin. Um, oh. Furthermore, I don't want that to be a sequence. It should really be a set. Uh, since it's ordering, doesn't matter. Um, well, that was... This is joyful, isn't it? Um... So let's go back to our spec. So here where I defined that I needed a sequence, I meant that I wanted a set. Oh, that was it. Two warnings found. All right, so set of coin. Okay, 7A, 1B, 1C. Beautiful. Um, that's kind of amazing. So this I would have struggled to write in Kotlin, but what I was able to quickly hack together in Scala. Um, all right, what's the next thing to add? Um, 7a, 1c, 1d. All right, let's just add all the rest of these in here. Uh, and the same for converting D to E and so forth. A, 1, D, 1, E. Why did I put a quote mark here? Seven, A, 1, E, 1, Fuel. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, three should not equal six. All right, so here we've defined something that can actually read uh, the inputs. Um, all right, well, that's cool. I guess this notion of coin and exchange um, uh, could be changed at this point. So we have a reaction. A reaction takes something and produces something. Um, so there is a notion in chemistry of a chemical. Um, yeah, I guess that's as good as it gets. All right, whatever. And now we're going to apply the same code replacement here. So map of chemical, a map of set of chemical to chemical, and we're going to change exchange to reaction. All right. Um, read reactions. Uh, all right.
right, so we've defined a really primitive set of tests here. Uh, get status will show I don't have anything up my sleeve. And we're going to say git commit with message. Solve problem 14 work in progress. Just in case I F everything up, um, we'll have a backup of this. Uh, git log. Git push. Say we're really certain this is what we want to push. Huh. Lieutenant Hummus is working on something Scala related and it's not advent of code. Um, I am amused. I am very thoroughly amused. Um, so yeah, Lieutenant Hummus is one of the other cool developers on this platform. Um, he does a lot of, uh, how do I even put this? He's good at what he does. He's efficient. The things he explains make sense. The code changes he makes, he makes quite rapidly, so not everybody's going to keep up with what he's doing. But people who have done coding before um, shouldn't struggle too badly with that, I don't think. So, um, yeah, now I'm drawing a blank. Well, okay, I know how to write the test. Let's write the test. Um, and then call it a day. So we defined our list of conversions. Um, and so we have this list of reactions. And we need 165 ore to produce one fuel. Um, so I'm not even sure what to call the function or something. Um, but let's see, I mean, I could say, here we go, here we created a new function called it react, and this produces a number of, uh, or, or this produces, this defines how many or we need to produce the fuel. Um, and I mean, we could just as well call that solve or whatever we want to call it. Um, and if we want to be really super fancy about it, maybe we say, uh, solve problem. I'm sorry, we could actually take the chain of reactions that's defined there. Um, yeah, that's... Here's a way we can do this. Um, the way to test this incrementally. Consume 45 ore to produce 10A. Okay. Um, so we've defined a reaction class up here. Um, Let's see. Instead of just immediately returning that set, um, we just return the reactions and not turn it into a map. I don't know. We still need some way, some interactor that takes the reactions and produces chemicals from chemicals. Um, and so I'm starting to think that I've done everything backwards here. Um, so we're taking each of those and mapping it into a reaction. 
Huh, all tests passed. Um, but yeah, here I need something that... Some kind of workbench or something that takes the reactions and actually exercises them. That consumes the 45 ore to produce the 10A. That consumes the 64 ore to produce the 24B etc. Um, so I've defined the recipes but I did not define the mechanism that exercises them which arguably is way more important than the data mapping itself. I'm not doing this in some sort of data-driven language although perhaps I should have if I were doing this enclosure or something, perhaps I should have started with the data as I did here. It might have made sense for me to start with. Um, I need some place in which I can combine chemicals to produce other things. So, uh, thankfully, this data structure val results is not too hard to produce. Um, I do like that I have this case class reaction thing. I just don't know what I'm going to do with it. Because I still need um, def react, which is going to take some set of uh, chemicals. Um, going to return apparently one chemical that's weird a chemical apparently has an amount um, and this is where this gets backwards is that um, to create a chemical apparently I need to have an input string well, that doesn't work so well anymore, does it? Um, an input string is no longer a fundamental aspect of a chemical. So, you just watch as this just continues to degrade. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, this ability to match a string, to transform the string into a chemical with the currency in amount. Currency is also a bad name here, but nothing's using it yet. Um, we could call it an element. We could call it whatever we want. I don't think the problem gave it a description. I mean, they do use the word chemical, but they use it to mean everything. Um, they don't use something to separately describe um, the components from which, I don't know. Yeah, they don't define like reagents um, uh, in both an amount and a chemical type or chemical separate from their composition. Um, a reagent would be something that, yeah. <sighs> a reagent participates in a reaction. So there we go. In fact, from that I could see not just here's the one thing that you could produce, but I could produce a dictionary of all the possibilities that could be produced from this particular set, which might be more interesting um, than just performing a single reaction. So at this point, um, I know this is like super unexciting to break here, but also my brain's kind of exploding, both with the number of ways I've coded this incorrectly the difficulty I'm having explaining this, 
and um, just the confusion I'm having going forward with this solution. So it probably makes sense for you to break at this point, even though we don't have a complete solution. Um, if I continue struggling in this way, it's not going to improve in the short term and possibly not in the long term. So I think uh, we'll cut it there. Sorry about the abrupt break. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, go check out what Lieutenant Hummus, LT Hummus, is up to. He's always uh, doing something fun. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good night.